Hi, I'm Jelani Nelson, um, recording from UC Berkeley in California, and I'm here to kick off the ICPC University Lecture Series. So this is a little bit about me. Let me introduce myself. I am from the United States Virgin Islands in the Caribbean, very close to Puerto Rico. This is my hometown right here. Um, I left Paradise for college. I went to MIT where I double majored in math and computer science. And that's when I first heard about algorithms and competitive programming. Back then, code forces didn't exist yet. Top coder was the big thing. Two of my friends, Antimatter and Dave, Dave AGP, Hubert Wang and David Pritchard got me into it in my third year of college. Antimatter himself is an ICPC alum. Um, he participated in the world finals in 2006 in Tokyo. Um, Anyway, I, after I got into it, I trained myself a lot that summer, and I did things like you know the, the Top Coder Open, the Collegiate Challenge, and Google Code Jam. Then I stayed at MIT for grad school, um, both master's and PhD in computer science, and I was a co-coach for the ICPC team at MIT for three years, and we went to three world finals then. That was Tokyo, Banff, and Stockholm. And um, research-wise, I was doing research in theoretical computer science, more specifically algorithms. Um, after grad school, I founded a, a summer camp that trains high schoolers in Ethiopia in algorithms called Adis Coder. Still runs today. Um, after that, my first full-time job was as a professor at Harvard in computer science, and I was a co-coach for the ICPC team there for five years with Bob Walton. Uh, primarily taught undergrad and graduate algorithms courses. And now I am a professor of computer science at UC Berkeley, and I still do research in algorithms. So as I mentioned, I'm here to kick off the ICPC University Lecture Series, which I hope you'll enjoy. And what is this thing all about? It really all started about five and a half years ago. Um, I sent an email uh, to Bill Patcher and Jeff Donahue, which I've pasted some of here. But basically what I noticed is, look, there are a lot of really bright, you know, um, algorithms enthusiasts that are coming, that, are, that participate in the ICPC. Um, but, you know, when you look at ICPC problems, of course, they're very fun and you know challenging, but you know, they require you to use a certain kind of toolkit of algorithms in clever ways. But that toolkit is mostly algorithms from you know textbooks like CLRS, etc. Not all of them, you know, min, co min cost max flow isn't, but um, but you know, most, by and large, these algorithms are from kind of 1950s to 1980s, so many decades ago. So my idea was, hey, look, at the World Finals. Um, we have this week of events on top of the actual contest. What if one of the events was a lecture given by a currently active researcher who can talk about modern algorithms research and let everybody know what we've been doing lately, we algorithms researchers, okay? Um, so that's what we're starting to do now with this online series. And so, you know, what do I mean that a lot of the algorithms that we use in ICPC tend to be older? Well, let's take a look at some of them, okay? So fast Fourier transform, um, you know, I remember um, I think it was the, was it the 2016 World Finals? There was a problem that required the FFT. The FFT was known by Gauss um, more than 200 years ago in 1805. It's often cited as an algorithm by Cooley and Tukey from the 60s, but actually Gauss knew about it even before. And even the 60s is you know, 55 years ago, or 60 years ago, 1960, 60 years ago. Uh, Prim's algorithm is also really old for minimum spanning tree, 1930. Uh, simplex, I've seen algorithms for simplex um, uh, I've seen problems in ICPC that need simplex and, you know, that need linear programming. And simplex by Danzig was 1947. That's quite old. Um, hashing with chaining, hash tables from the 50s, Ford Fulkerson, Bellman Ford Dijkstra, Kruskal, all from the 50s. Even algorithms that I would say ICPCers know are, you know, is a complicated algorithm, like, you know, non-bipartite matching Edmonds algorithm with blossoms. Even that's pretty old. That's from 1965. That's almost 60 years ago. Um, you know, if going to the other side, I mean, there are some algorithms that are newer. Like the newest one I have on this slide is suffix arrays. Again, this algorithm, you know, this slide doesn't have all algorithms that have ever appeared at ICPC, but a lot of them. But, you know, even suffix arrays are 30 years old now. We're in 2020, right? So you might look at this and say, hey, you algorithm people, what have you been doing for the last few decades? Have you just been sleeping at the wheel? 
And what we'd like to show you in this lecture series is no, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in algorithms research right now. So here's some here's some recent recent-ish algorithms for problems that you're familiar with, like sorting. Okay, so merge sort, quick sort, or n log n. In fact, you can get n log log n, and that's using the power of the word ram. That was by uh, E.J. Hahn in 2002. What I mean by the, by the power of the word ram? Look, when you have an array of things you want to sort, it's not you can't you, you know comparisons are not the only thing you can do. You know, I'm assuming that the things that you're sorting fit in a machine word, right? Otherwise, it takes more than constant time even to touch an item that you're that that's in the array. And you know, if it fits in a machine word, you can multiply it with other things. You can do bitwise XOR. You know, you can do all kinds. You can use it as an index into memory. So if you use the full power of the word RAM, you can actually get faster. And with a randomized algorithm, you can even get n times the square root of log log n. Minimum spanning tree, not word RAM, just vanilla comparison-based algorithms. You can actually do better than prim and Kruskal, you can get m times inverse Ackerman of n. You might have seen inverse Ackerman, for example, in the analysis of disjoint forest for union find. Uh, there's a funny algorithm here by Petty and Ramachandran where it's a comparison-based deterministic algorithm that's provably optimal within a constant factor. There is no um, comparison-based deterministic algorithm that is asymptotically faster than the Petty Ramachandran algorithm. Now, what is the runtime of your algorithm? No one knows, even they don't know. They somehow managed to prove that it's optimal without actually being able to understand what the runtime is. So it's kind of a magic algorithm. Okay. Single source shortest paths, that's what Dijkstra solves. Again, with word RAM, you can do faster than Dijkstra. You can get linear time. There's no log ends anywhere. No, you, know, you, can, you don't suffer the log end from heaps. Um, going down further, max flow. That's a problem that we all know in ICPC. And capital U here is the maximum capacity on any edge. So imagine that the capacities are integers from one to capital U. Um, so, you know, for example, in the reduction of non-bipartite max matching to flow, capital U is just one, right? Because all the capacities are either zero or one in, in non-bipartite matching. So there you don't care, you don't mind using an algorithm that has a large dependence on U. And, you know, so here there's this algorithm by Lou and Sidford, and I put Lou in red because he is an ICPC alum. He participated in the World Finals twice, um, once for MIT in Beijing, and once for Stanford in Porto, in Portugal. Okay. And then if you want better dependence on U, so for example, you have large capacities, there's an m root n log U algorithm due to Lee and Sidford not that long ago, 2014. And these other, you know, the other ones that I just mentioned, Lou, Sidford, and Kathoria, are from 2020, this year. They're very recent. Uh, and Lu is gonna, Yang Lu is gonna talk to you later today with one of his nice results in algorithms. Linear programming, the fastest known algorithms are from within the last few years. There's you know, one just last year. Global MinCut, one of the authors is Pavel Gavrihovsky, who's, a, who's been a coach for many years for University of Wrocław for ICPC. So he's also connected to ICPC. And um, Global MinCut is MinCut in weighted but undirected graphs. So you can do it in m log squared n algorithm, the deterministic algorithm, that's due to them. Previously it was m log cubed n due to Karger, and that was a randomized algorithm. So they both improved the runtime and made it deterministic. Edit distance, um, maybe you know an nk algorithm. So n squared, we all know, that's the vanilla DP algorithm for edit distance. If, you, if you're if you promised that the edit distance is at most k, you can actually get an nk dp algorithm. Basically, you just need to keep a width 2k interval around the diagonal in the dp table. That gives you nk. And if you throw that idea, if you combine that idea with suffix trees, you can actually get an n plus k squared algorithm. That's this 1998 algorithm. There's a log sigma dependence on the alphabet size. That comes from the suffix trees, the suffix tree. You can also get a constant factor approximation in almost linear time. That's due to Andoni and Nosatsky. Andoni was a coach for the MIT ICPC team, a co-coach about 15 years ago. Hashing, what does hashing solve? The dictionary problem. What is the dictionary problem? I would like to, so to store a database of key value pairs such that people can query keys and I give them the value. Static means I'm not allowed to update the database. I can't insert or delete. Uh, that would be dynamic. So static, nearly optimal space, okay? Uh, best known algorithm is this year due to Hua Cheng Yu. ICPC alum competed for Qinghua in the world finals at Harbin, okay? Uh, integer multiplication. People may have heard of schrodinger strassen based on FFT that runs in time n log n log log n. Turns out you don't need that log log n. That was proven just last year. Knapsack. NP hard problem. Even though it's NP hard, you can get an approximation algorithm. I'll get at least the one minus epsilon fraction of the maximum value I can possibly pack into that knapsack. 
Best known runtime for that, dude, it's Su Jin, ICPC alum for Tsinghua, competed in Rapid City, the world finals. And there, there's a lot of research in theoretical computer science and algorithms that just doesn't fit within kind of the framework of ICPC. It doesn't make for a good programming problem. For example, like research into quantum computation. And I don't know about you, but I've, you know, I've never been able to play with a quantum computer. We don't, you know, we don't have them at the world finals at ICPC. But um, a breakthrough result just this year is I, MIP star equals RE. Um, what is RE? It stands for recursively enumerable, also known as Turing recognizable. Okay, I won't define it here, but um, it's, it contains the halting problem. The halting problem is an example of a problem that's in RE. Okay? So what this is saying is um, you can use kind of quantum to solve the halting problem in this MIP star model. What is MIP star? So maybe you've heard of P versus NP. What is NP? NP is the class of problems where there's a verifier and a prover. The prover sees the input for the problem, let's say vertex cover writes down a proof, gives it to the prover. The verifier, imagine the prover can solve all kinds, prover can solve everything, okay? The prover is omnipotent, can run an exponential time, can run, you know, can do whatever it wants. So the prover knows the answer to vertex cover. The prover just has to convince the verifier of the answer, writes a proof. What kind of proof? For example, writes down which vertices are in the vertex cover, okay? And the verifier can check, oh yes, there is a vertex cover of size at most five because, you know, here's the proof that I verified from the prover. Okay, so that's NP, non-deterministic polynomial time. Then there's IP. IP is interactive proofs. IP, IP is and the verifier can talk back and forth. So the prover says something and the verifier says, huh, okay, that's interesting. Based on that, I have a follow-up question. Prover says something again. Oh, okay, okay, I have a follow-up question. And then they, they interact back and forth and the verifier still has to run in polynomial time, okay? And it turns out that IP, interactive proofs, the class of yes-no problems, Boolean problems you can solve with an interactive proof is, is equal to another class called P-space, polynomial space, the class of all problems you can solve in polynomial space, which is at least as powerful as NP, okay? And then there's multi-prover interactive proofs where you have multiple provers that are all trying to convince you and you can talk to all of them, but they're not allowed to talk to each other. So they're not allowed to collude. And it turns out this is even more powerful. And this is, you know, MIP it was shown um, by Baba I. Lund and Fortnow that is, it's equal to NX, non-deterministic exponential time, which is even more, more powerful than P-space. MIP star is MIP. But by the way, even in NX, you can't solve the halting problem, okay? You can still only solve solvable problems. MIP star is MIP, but where the provers, even though they're not allowed to communicate, they share quantumly entangled bits ahead of time. And it turns out that just having that quantum resource allows them with the verifier to help the verifier solve problems like the halting problem, problems that are not decidable problems. Okay, so that's pretty crazy, and that's a breakthrough uh, result in quantum computation recently. Another breakthrough result just two years ago by Urmila Mahadev, what she showed was that even, you know, let's say that someone comes to you and says, hey, guess what, I have a quantum computer. And you're like, really? Prove it to me. But I want you to prove it to me, but I'm, I'm not quantum. I'm only a classical computer. It turns out that there is a way, she proved, for classical computers to verify that a quantum computer is actually quantum, is actually using the power of quantum computation. Okay. Um, cryptography is another area, homomorphic encryption. What's that? Homomorphic encryption says, look, I want to compute on a huge data set, but I don't have the compute resources, so I'm gonna put it in the cloud and tell Amazon or Google, compute, you know, run this program on this huge database for me. But, you know, I don't necessarily want to trust this big company, so I'm gonna send encrypted data. So normally, if I send encrypted data, they would have to decrypt, run the computation, re-encrypt and send it back to me. But that's defeating the point, because I don't want them to know what's in the data, okay? I don't want Amazon and Google to know, yet I want them to compute for me. So homomorphic encryption is this magic thing, magical thing where you can encrypt data in a certain way, in a homomorphic way, send it to Google and Amazon encrypted. They will run your program on the encrypted data without ever decrypting it and send you back the encrypted answer. And this whole time, they have no clue what data they are computing on. Okay, so in fact, this is possible. This was shown by Craig Gentry just in 2009 that it's possible to do this. I'm going to skip lots of these. Data structure lower bounds. Okay, so lower bounds don't really appear in ICPC. What's a lower bound? Okay, well, an upper bound is an algorithm. It's like, how fast can I solve this problem? 
I can do it in n squared. I can do it in n to the 1.5. These are upper bounds on the complexity of the problem. A lower bound is saying, um, no matter what I do, no matter how clever I am, there simply does not exist an algorithm that runs in time n log n. Any, you know, it or runs in time faster than n log n. That would be a lower bound. Okay, so there's been a lot of progress in lower bounds, especially for data structural problems. Um, complexity theory, um, graph isomorphism. Graph, okay, so you know about graph isomorphism. Well, the fastest known algorithm for that is, you know, runs in time, quasi-polynomial just means n to the poly log n. Okay, so it's, it's less than exponential, right? Exponential would be like two to the poly n. n to the poly log n is the same thing as like two to the poly log n, right? So instead of two to the poly n, it's two to the poly log n. So there's a quasi-polynomial time algorithm for graph isomorphism due to Babai just a few years ago, okay? So there's a lot of exciting stuff. We have a lot of exciting speakers who are eager to present to you, including Yang Lu, who's gonna to talk to you later today. And you might be looking at this and say, Jelani, hey, this looks all looks really cool. And maybe you'll even think it's cooler after you see some of the talks with some of the cool technical details. How can I do algorithms research with theoretical computer science research? And this is, you know, I just wanna put in a plug, go to grad school. Grad school is the place you go to train to do research, okay? And then after grad school, you can have a career in research if you'd like. Um, and here's a URL where you can go get advice on applying to grad school. Just a little bit of awareness. What does it take to apply to grad school? Send your transcripts from university. Get three letters of recommendation, ideally from professors who can talk about your research potential. Okay. Take the GRE. Most universities these days require it. Some don't. Okay. Many are talking about getting rid of the requirement. Uh, there's also the subject test, which is optional. Um, I didn't take it when I applied. You know, a lot of people don't take it. It's not required, but you can take it if you'd like. Um, submit, you know, submit those. Submit your statement of purpose, which is just basically a one to two page essay describing your research interests for the future and also research you've done so far. And submit by the university application deadline online, usually early to mid-December. And um, just in terms of importance, universities care a lot for PhD programs about research experience and rec letters, recommendation letters that talk about your research experience. Don't talk about your grades. You know, you don't want record letters to talk about your grades necessarily as much, but your research experience. That's very, very, very important. Transcripts are also important. Not as important, but they're important. And then the GRE is very unimportant. I mean, mildly important, but not that important. Yeah. Which is why a lot of schools are thinking of getting rid of it, because most universities don't really even care about it. Um, how do you get research experience? You can get it by, you know, working with professors at your own local university, or, you know, you can do theory, you know, theoretical computer science internships. For example, there's one at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Just Google this, Chinese University of Hong Kong ITCSC Theory Summer Internship. In Switzerland, there are some at EPFL and ETH Zurich. Um, or you can just, you know, just cold email individual faculty. Say, hey, I read your papers. This looks super cool. I would love to come by your, you know, your group in the summer and do research with you. Or even, you know, um, maybe not even come physically, but just talk online, okay? Um, sometimes that works. Okay. So anyway, I hope you love this series and we're going to have some exciting speakers uh, for you in the near future starting today. Take care.